Let's uh, start off with our speakers. So first of all, uh, let's welcome Dr. Alan Mendoza, the director of the, uh, the Henry Jackson Institute Society. Very nice to see you. Thank you. Um, further over, I think. Uh, secondly, uh, let's, uh, let's have um, Professor Tom Brooks, who's a professor of law at the University of Durham. Hello, scarcely hello. had a chance to say hello. Thank you. If you'd sit there. And um, thirdly, uh, Thomas Mace Archer Mills, who's a constitutional expert. Thank you. And um, finally, uh, Mohammed bin Hamid bin Jalal Al Murray, who has some interesting stories to tell about uh, how his family has been treated. How do you do? Thank you very much. Please sit down. Okay, now I'm going to sit down. Now, we are, we've got a, uh, um, in some ways, we've, we're cutting here to the very um, nature of what Qatar is about. We know about its global plans. We know some of the things about the way it's been um, uh, following those plans. But what we want to look at, I think, mostly here is how, what sort of state Qatar is, uh, how it treats its citizens, and what its aim is, uh, as far as we can tell. And um, I'd, I'd first of all, in fact, um, like to, to invite you, uh, if I may, to give a little indication about what's happened to your family. You're in exile, you're not able to return to Qatar, and those of your family who are still there have had a uh, have had lots of problems, haven't they? Just explain that to us briefly. Uh, I'm sure, this is. Can we? Could Hello. you? Hello. Ah, that's yeah. It. Uh, I did not hear the interpreting of your question, but uh, first I want to introduce myself. My name is Mohammed bin Hamad bin Jalal Al Marri. I am from the uh, Ghufran tribe uh, in Al Murra. Since 1996, we have been suffering, and this carried on until 2001. And then this was exacerbated in 2005 until yesterday. There is a number of military officers who have sworn that they will never betray the country or the emir. And these officers were thrown in prison. They have now reached more than 200 prisoners. One of them is my father. Even though he was outside Qatar, they were tortured. My father was tortured. He underwent an operation due to the hernia that he got as a result of the torture. After two and a half to three years of being imprisoned, there is a group of them that was acquitted. So this means that there, were no, uh, there was no evidence against them that they did anything wrong. And they were only 21 prisoners who were set free. Unfortunately, the Qatari regime to 
took away the nationality from Al Ghufran tribe. They were put outside the country. They were uh, sent outside the country. Uh, they uh, now live in exile. They have suffered a lot. They were prevented from uh, seeking medical assistance at hospitals. Their children cannot go to schools. They are suffering from mental health problems. They are Qatari citizens and they participated in Al-Zubara war, and it is a very ancient war in our history, and only real Qataris participated in this war, not people who came from other countries, but really original Qataris. And even though we are Qataris through and through, we are suffering. Uh, my mother uh, is now suffering from cancer as a result of all the stress. Uh, my brother, my sister, and myself, including my mother, uh, we um, cannot reach. Um, we cannot reach the rest of our family. And my mother suffered uh, from cancer until she died, and we could not visit her. When the diplomatic relations were severed between Qatar and the rest of the Gulf countries. We were against severing the relations. Uh, we said that uh, this is like severing family ties. And this is something that we object to. We consider uh, Gulf people as a one big family. We have been suffering for decades now. and we would like to see a solution. And um, a pertinent uh, uh, account. Um, Alan Mendoza, how, how typical is that? And, and why should one section of the population, as opposed to others, uh, be suffering in this way? Well, I, I think it's actually a very broad topic that we're discuss discussing here in terms of looking at the way the uh, regime operates uh, domestically, um, how it looks at the question of human rights internally, and juxtaposing that with the image it seeks to present internationally. In fact, arguably, there is a, the, you know, if you look at the Qatari constitution, even the constitution says something very different to the story we've just heard. The constitution enshrines certain rights, it enshrines the right of you know, not being detained, uh, you know, equality for all, all these questions, and those are not actually uh, practiced. This has been pointed out in numerous different ways, whether it is in gender issues, whether it is in um, different classes and groups of people. Uh, whether it is the case we've just heard, whether it is the uh, the migrant labour cases, there you know, there are um, clearly positions taken by the Qatari regime domestically, which are uh, in conflict. Firstly, with its own constitution. Secondly, with the image of soft power it seeks to exert abroad. That case is one example. I'm sure we're going to hear more from colleagues on the panel about others as well. Tom Brooks, uh, how much, how damaging is this kind of thing to the the enterprise? that the Patari government has, has set itself? Well, I think it's enormously uh, damaging. It, it's not just a matter of, say, having a, a, a logical contradiction. It's not just we say something and we do something uh, different that is the uh, real issue, um, as it were. But I think that um, in projecting a particular image of itself to the world as a progressive place, a, a country that um, is, a, is, is the future, or a, perhaps even a model uh, for other places in its region and, and, and wider, um, it failing to live up to its own um, stated standards, there's a disconnect um, that can be very real and very palpable. We've seen uh, various movements in other countries, uh, not least, you know, the United States, Britain, um, aspirations of all men created equal, and over time, people start to take that seriously. And, they, and this separation between the ideals that are presented to the world versus the reality on the ground becomes something very real and something very damaging for the regime indeed. And if I can give one other particular example, uh, John, I would say that, uh, say with the World Cup um, uh, winning, you know, that's coming up in the future, and we might come speak more about this, I don't know, 
Um, World Cup, on the one hand, is normally normally an enormous opportunity for any country who has that to showcase its country, to attract investment, both internally and from abroad, to attract tourism, and, and to shed a real spotlight on a country and put it on the world stage and gather a lot of attention. Usually a very positive thing, and sometimes they do even better than normal in the tournament. Um, but on the other side, um, the issue here is that uh, the Qatari image that is projected, which is not reflected on the ground, if things don't change soon, this added spotlight on that country will become out of its control as the world's media descends on that country and then pokes around and sees that what they say isn't what they do. Looking at migrant labor, looking at some of the issues, the isolationism that's been creating and causing uh, human rights abuses, these things are going to come to light and make things very worse. So instead of things like the World Cup being an effort of soft power that brings great benefit uh, to uh, Qatar, the real risk that they're running at the moment, given the current situation, is that it could be deeply damaging for many years to come. Uh, Thomas Mace Archer Mills, you're um, uh, an expert on, on constitutional monarchy. Uh, does this apply in Qatar? I mean, it does supposedly, but does it in fact? Well, supposedly it is supposed to matter. In Article 36 of the Qatari Constitution, according to the story that I've just heard from the gentleman to my right, which guarantees the rights and the liberties and makes torture illegal, I'm sorry, but this is not a constitutional monarchy. And for all the research that is done on Qatar, there is no parliament as the people were promised. A sovereign gains their authority from the voice and the will of the people. And in the United Kingdom, Her Majesty, as sovereign, is in place because the people allow and want her to be. And in being a good sovereign and a good monarch, and enshrining liberty and democracy through parliament and the voice and will of the people, we can honestly say we are a constitutional monarchy. However, Qatar is not. There is no parliament, there's no democracy, there's no will of the people, I've quoted Article 36 of their own constitution, and I'll refer to Article 38 and 56 as well. So when we look at case in point scenarios as to what constitutes a constitutional monarchy, all of the media coverage, whatever is on the website, however Qatar wants to view themselves, the reality is very different in the real world. They are not giving democracy to the people through parliament on the actual ability of letting the sovereign rule through the will of the people. The sovereign is ruling on his own accord, on his own will, without any care for the care of his people. But he clearly cares very much about the way that people think about Qatar outside the, the country and perhaps uh, inside the country. And I mean, th there's been a certain degree of effectiveness about this, hasn't there, Alan? I mean, uh, the, I remember very clearly when um, Colonel Gaddafi was overthrown in Libya, uh, crowds of people were waving the Qatari flag because Qatar had taken these uh, extraordinary steps of getting involved in, in the revolution, supporting it, and, and kind of seeing it through. Where does it, um, what, what, what are its purposes in the, in the Gulf region to, that it should get involved in something like that? Well, it's a very good question, and I think 20 years ago, none of us would have been sitting around a room here talking about Qatar. It wouldn't have been the case. I think it's been a very conscious policy uh, by the ruling family uh, to exert influence. Now, why do they want to exert influence? Well, firstly, it is down to internal dynamics within the royal family itself. Um, the transitions of power, a coup in 95, the, you know, the, the shoring up within the regime of the old guard versus the new guard, and the need to present uh, Qatar as a modern progressive country rather than what had been before. So there's a domestic imperative there. Regionally, of course, that change in power affected regional power dynamics as well. Again, the ruling family had to show itself in some way uh, to be, um, again, forward-thinking and doing something different to what had happened, or else why have the coup at all in that kind of case? Now, moving forward, what's the best way of trying to exert yourself? Well, there are two ways, as, as all of us on the panel know. You have hard power options, and of course they dabbled a bit in this in Libya, as you mentioned, but hard power is coercive. 
you're attempting to get things done obviously through force of some kind, whether it is uh, sanctions or uh, military action. A far more effective measure, as most people know, is soft power. The idea that you can achieve your ends by people essentially liking what you're doing and going along with it because of the attractiveness of what you are doing. And I think what we have seen for a significant period of time through things like Al Jazeera, which did shake up the Arab world when it started, even though we know the fundamental problems within uh, the system, how it operates, and you as a journalist certainly understand the parameters within which Al Jazeera operate. You obviously have uh, educational attempts to move out and to show the attractiveness of Qatar's educational abilities and strength. Art, the art world, lots of sponsorship of that, attempting to make Qatar this great patron of the art. And then you come, of course, to uh, sports, and we've discussed briefly the World Cup, and you see that even uh, recently in the case of this extraordinary uh, Neymar football transfer to Paris Saint-Germain, a club owned in large by the Qatari uh, family again. The idea being, look, let's get out there, show the world we're participating. We're being part of this. We're a positive force. Look, we like the game that you like to play. We're, you know, we want to get better at it. We want you to come and play with us on it. And then you come to this task you mentioned in Libya, which is an attempt to be diplomatic, to mediate firstly, to get engaged, and then, if that doesn't work, to push an agenda. But I think it's interesting you, you chose Libya rather than some of the other potential mediation efforts. You could have picked Lebanon, you could have picked the Fatah, Hamas attempts, things like that, Yemen, the early Yemen attempts. Libya, I think, marks a difference because Qatar chose a side. It wasn't a neutral party in this, in the same way that it tried to present in other cases. It wanted to overthrow Gaddafi, as I think most people did once it became clear he wanted to murder the population, but it consciously put its money and its efforts into doing so. And it did the same, obviously, in Egypt and in Syria as well. And the attempt there, I think, marks a change. It was almost soft power with a bit of hard power moving it together. But I don't think, actually, if you look at the results, that they're what Qatar would have wanted from that. And we discussed, obviously, the World Cup case being, you put the more spotlights on it, actually it becomes less attractive. Equally in diplomacy, I think if you focus on what Qatar has done and what it's got out of it, I'm not sure Qatar is domestically would think it's money well spent. Tom, the nature of uh, the, the whole World Cup uh, uh, experiment uh, is uh, can be quite disturbing, can't it, at times? I mean, you hear what's happened to migrant workers and so forth. But, I mean, is that, how, how important is that? And how much is that going to affect public opinion, both inside Qatar and outside? Won't the same sort of thing, perhaps not quite on the same scale, or not on the same scale, happened in China? Uh, with the Olympic Games. Um, it almost happened uh, to some extent in Brazil. Mm. People do die when things are being constructed, particularly in difficult climates. Um, should we blame Qatar? Should we say this is the kind of price that Qatar has to, play, has to pay? Or do we say, well, you know, you can't make an omelette without breaking eggs? Well, I think that the, 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 the several issues are um, uh, uh, present here. One of them is the, the scale and the numbers of people that have died. Um, dozens have died uh, putting um, the, the, the building the stadium, getting the infrastructure uh, ready. There was one dying, one person migrant dying every two days at one point. So there's, a, there's an issue of, of, of scale and speed of the harm that was going on. I think that while it is true that you can point to other countries as you have and noted, well, look, lots of people get hurt on construction sites in general, not always getting killed. Um, and this is just a big construction site, so what's so different or what's so worrying about this? I think part of the worry here is, in addition to the scale and the speed, that it's uh, a, a, a very good sign uh, um, or um, a touchstone for a wider issue, that this issue here of, of, of the very poor uh, migrant labor conditions in Qatar around the World Cup aren't just about the migrant laborers in the World Cup, that they also are conditions faced by others elsewhere in construction and not. There are fairly repressive and, and I think extreme um, measures uh, on, on forced migrant labor that um, many human rights organizations have likened to some form of slavery, particularly um, uh, where it's the employer who controls whether or not uh, someone can leave uh, the, the country. You know, um, 
from any country. This does this... apply in other Gulf states, doesn't it? And I mean, it applies in uh, uh, particularly, I think, in Dubai, but others as well. It's not unique to Qatar, but I think that the 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 uh, the level and the range um, and the arbitrariness about how the rules are applied are a real issue. Do you think, uh, Thomas? Do you think this is? because uh, Qatar is, is effectively uh, an autocracy trying to present itself as something more liberal? Of course it is. This is a absolute regime which is definitely trying to appeal to the Western countries through media, through having a PR stunt and publicity. When we look at everything that has to deal with Qatar, it, they want to promote themselves as being fair across the board, constitutional monarchy. We've gone ahead, we've had a referendum in 2003. We want to appeal to the West. However, at the same time, we have an autocratic regime that is also appealing to the other side. And this is how the royal family in Qatar like to play, both sides against each other so they come out on top. And what they're doing by stating that they are a constitutional monarchy is duping the world. And this is something that no PR department is going to be able to fix, because the more that you go down the middle road, it's harder to make decisions as the end result. So either you're going to make good on the promises you've made to your people, you're going to show as an example to the world that you mean what you've said, you've implemented the constitution, you've allowed an elected parliamentary democracy to not only begin to be built, but allow it to thrive with a limited hand of royal authority in the actual mix. And this is something that we're very lucky in the United Kingdom to have. But I also have to look at Qatar itself. And with British influence there for almost a hundred years, I am not understanding why Qatar is really wanting to push constitutional monarchy. They're not just lying to the world, they're lying to themselves. And when we look at the gentleman next to me and we look at the chairman of this conference who has been manhandled, who has actually suffered at the hand of the crown, this is not constitutional monarchy. This is not pro-human rights. This is a whitewashing of what Qatar wants people to believe about their current monarchy, their current regime. And again, I will say that freedom wears a crown. However, the person wearing the crown must allow democracy to breathe and to have proper roots within their own country. Alan, I'd like to widen it a little bit. Qatar's relationship with Iran is, is really quite interesting now, isn't it? And it's, it's starting to change the politics of the whole, of the whole region. What, what, what do you think sparked that off in the first place? Well, I think the, uh, the whole nature of Qatar's relations with its neighbours um, could take the whole panel uh, to look at if you uh, were to break it down. I mean, essentially, you have a country that is fairly isolated uh, because of its own activities and the way it's tried to force itself onto the agenda and push aside its neighbours in its own pursuit of glory. So rather than the usual area of cooperation you see in the Gulf, you see Qatar setting itself up to be different, to be brash, to do the things that other countries it feels uh, do don't want to do. But in doing so, of course, it's alienated its traditional allies. And as a result, it has to look for new allies. And the two ways I think you've seen Qatar operate in recent years has been number one to be a disruptive force. This is not, Qatar is not a force for stability in the region, it's a force for instability in the region. The only other force for instability in the region is Iran, a country that's also seeking to challenge the established order and to bring itself to be the hegemon in the area. So in a sense the two have something in common. They both want to upend the established order and they both attempt to do so by intervening abroad in order to do it as well. So you see Qatar obviously supporting Hamas terrorism. That's obvious case getting out there trying to tra you know in getting in itself involved in a conflict that it has nothing to do with essentially. In Syria, Libya, Egypt it's taken sides, picked sides in a bid to disrupt what's gone on. Iran has picked sides as well in various places. Now, interestingly, Qatar and Iran are on different sides in Syria, but they're on the same side when it comes to challenging Saudi Arabia. 
which is of course Iran's major preoccupation in uh, the Gulf. So what you can see is a marriage of convenience, essentially, where Qatar sees a need to disrupt Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf states. Iran sees the same need and desire to do so. And when an opportunity presents itself, like the recent uh, boycott and demands, it's no surprise that Iran is the country that is riding seemingly to Qatar's uh, rescue, together, of course, with Turkey, another power that seeks a little further away, that seeks to disrupt the order and put itself in there. So it's, it can be easily explained, I think, by the by this old, old, old adage, my enemy's enemy is my friend. Uh, Tom, I'm going to, we've, we've had some, uh, uh, some questions from the audience, and so we'll get through as many as we can. Um, here's one question. Is Qatar's rep uh, reputation damaged by negative publicity it receives for exploitation of migrant workers, terrorism funding, and human rights abuses? Well, absolutely, and I think that it's, it's not just a matter of having a bad press or negative headlines that is going to be, I think, the medium to long-term uh, damage that the that, that Qatar should be uh, worried about, the Qatar regime. I think that uh, moving forward, uh, it's going to be, as the spotlight gets brighter as we move towards the World Cup, um, there's a real risk that what could be a great opportunity of growth and prosperity and, and a really good story, a narrative, was discussed earlier uh, for the country that could really showcase itself to the world because become something um, uh, not just embarrassing but just something they're going to really want to uh, hide away and, and, and do without. Um, it's true that there's been um, problems in the construction of other World Cup sites before that we've already discussed but one thing that might be changing is that um, uh, public sensitivity to matters like this, not least in the sensitivity of advertisers and sponsors of major events to uh, efforts like this. Um, it, it, isn't, you know, it would have been unimaginable uh, a year ago that uh, leading business people uh, would want to quit uh, a committee advising the American president. Um, we've already seen sensitivity on that side of people saying, no, I'm gone, I'm going to quit, I'm going to leave, because I don't want to be associated with things that might harm other commercial interests. I think you can see a similar parallel to starting to develop with Qatar, that if they continue down this road with human rights abuses, as, as this becomes um, uh, more widely known, more widely publicized, so we get closer to that event, that sponsors and others are going to pull away, um, and it's going to become a more damaging thing. And then, and you have to wonder, going back to the previous question, if I can, why um, go down this road? Why? Uh, we, we can understand many countries will want to uh, have an influence in the world that will be the desire of many a uh, world leader. But there's some ways of going about that, and there's other ways that are not. And some are more fruitful uh, than others. And it seems that this is a road that should not be taken. Um, yes, I, I follow what you're saying. There's a very good question here uh, from the audience. Um, some of it we've, we've covered already, but um, Thomas, if you'd start us off, and I'd like everybody to uh, talk about this, please. While the Constitution uh, provides for freedom of speech and press, and press, association, and peaceful assembly, these rights are regulated by the authorities. Can international pressure play a role in convincing the ruling family to change these laws that limit these rights? I mean, it's a continuation of what you were just saying. Yes, yes, of course. And, and this is something that we've seen throughout history. International pressure throughout royal families is part of the PR, which our own royal family here in the United Kingdom uses. If we were ever to see our sovereign accused of anything, there would automatically be an inquiry. Parliament would automatically want to question that, and it would create a constitutional crisis in this country. Uh, so when we look at whether a constitution can actually guarantee rights in a constitutional monarchy, the answer is yes. And international influence does play a part. And we've already mentioned Libya, and I want to take us back to Libya that had a king. I want to take us back to countries that had kings before. And what happened in those countries when they didn't listen to their people, they didn't listen to international pressure, they're no longer in power. And if Qatar continues to go down the very road it's going, not only are they going to be exiled, they might actually end up in a worse position than some of the kings that have gone before them. So when we look at, uh, let's, Egypt, when we look at other 
kingdoms of the Middle East, and we wonder where they've gone, even Iraq, Afghanistan. Where are these sovereigns? What have they done? Why are they no longer in power? They did not heed international warning. They did not heed warning from their own people. And in the end, they didn't prevail. There was no self-preservation. And what we're doing at this conference is trying to show the world now that we in Qatar have an absolute, just phenomenal chance to say to the royal family, look, you have to heed the warnings. You must come around to constitutional monarchy because if you don't, not only has the stability of your region been disrupted, your neighbors are turning against you. And if your neighbors do that, your own people will turn against you. But Alan, the outside world, the Western world, is uh, hanging around as though embarrassed by all this, isn't it? I mean, you don't hear uh, lectures to the Qatari uh, royal family, um, or if you do, it's done very quietly. Um, do you think the, the, this kind of pressure is starting to mount? This kind of embarrassment that the other two have talked about? Well, the reason you don't hear it is because Qatar uses another tool quite effectively, which is economic power, in order to uh, silence discussion about its activities. You just have to walk out of uh, your building here, see the Shard. Who owns the Shard? Qatar. Other bits of London owned by Qatar. In our context in Britain, given the uh, need for investment and trade on a constant basis, nobody wants to be too upfront about human rights and such issues if there's a danger about those things. But the problem is that we now live in a world which isn't so easily um, constrained by what governments themselves want to do. Social media is out there. People share abuses on social media. Uh, international um, campaigns can start, human rights group can reach out very easily to people to start getting pressure on there. And I think the key thing actually is, yes, you can pressurize the royal family, but it's when Qataris themselves start feeling the pain of being associated with Qatar, when people start shuddering when they meet a Qatari and go, but you're the people who enslave migrant workers, aren't you? You're the people who uh, abuse terrorism in this kind of context. When that happens and Qataris go back home and say, "How? why is this happening to the monarchy? That, I think, is when you get the change. At the moment, I think Qataris have an acquiescence uh, to the royal family, but the royal family does not have consent. When they get to a stage when consent is then withheld, that's going to be the tipping point moment when things change. And if there are brave Qataris like people we have met today who are willing to do that, that is going to be the big catalyst for change in that society. Do you, would you agree, Tom? I mean, do you think there is a tipping point coming, or, or is this something that Western liberals would like to think, but it won't actually happen? Well, I suppose um, if we went back a few years in, back in time, it might be just a, a, a wish, a fantasy of Western liberals and the like that uh, wouldn't it be nice if, if there's a certain change in, in, in public consciousness. But one thing that's changing now is that, like it or not, globalization is, is accelerating in many ways. And I think that to keep certain things secret, what's really going on in the ground, our information, not least from your own uh, personal reporting around the world, but from many reporters, 